Good afternoon. And in true question time fashion, welcome to the Cathedral City of Peterborough. Population 184,500 in the census of 2011. Football club known as the Posh, which, one of, which uh, was managed up until fairly recently by one of my all-time heroes, Barry Fry. Yay, yes. Uh, famous Peterboroughians, probably the, uh, probably the most famous, Sir Henry Royce of the uh, Rolls-Royce motor car fame. Anyway, moving on with, uh, away from that piffle, and let's get on to uh, some proper stuff. Uh, could I introduce you to our, uh, our panel for, for this debate, uh, for this question time session? Uh, on my far right, we have uh, Tom Warnham, who is a poultry and cereal farmer and representing the National Farmers Union. Next to him, on his left, Dr. Alan Buckle, who is the chair of CREW, the Campaign for Responsible Rodenticidal Use. Uh, next to me on my right-hand side, we have Rupert Broom, who's the Group Managing Director of Killgerm Chemicals. Uh, myself, I wear two hats. I'm Martin Harvey, uh, the Managing Director of Harvey Environmental Services and also current President of the BPCA. To my left, I have uh, Dee Ward Thompson, who is the Technical Manager of the BPCA. To her left, there's Steve Bailey, who's the Managing Director of Baratine. And right at the end, which is exactly where he should be, uh, we have Henry Mott, who's the Managing Director of Conquer Pest Control. So, without any further ado, and I must say I feel this is probably, so far, the very best attended seminar, uh, which probably uh, gives an indication of the importance of it. So, uh, so let, let's move on. We have some questions from the floor. Um, uh, I would like to invite uh, Steve Bolter. Uh, where is Steve? Oh, there's Steve, good old Steve. Known him for years. Uh, could we take the microphone to Steve, please? And uh, if we could have your question. Uh, realistically, if the desired results of stewardship are not achieved, for whatever reasons, what does the panel see are the likely impacts? Is a total ban on SGARs the most likely immediate reaction? OK, thank you very much for that. Could I ask um, Alan Buckle to uh, answer that one, please, first of all? Okay, I'll, I'll answer it. We've been, we've been told to keep it short and to the point, so that's what we're going to do, no, no long waffly answers. So the answer to the question really is no. Um, we've been in conversation with HSE about what they want to do with anticoagulant rodenticides, um, and at no time has um, an absolute and total ban been, been suggested. Right across the EU, even the most severe regulatory authorities are not doing that. Um, if we don't see what we want to see in the results of stewardship over the next um, two or three years, um, my thinking, it's just my thinking, is that um, HSA will look at the most risky practices and that they'll, they'll look to uh, restrict or remove those uh, risky practices. So you might think open area use is perhaps at one end of a risk spectrum with regard to the use of anticoagulants. Um, outdoor use is certainly uh, in, in their eyes, uh, a risky use practice. So um, they might think to restrict rodenticides to indoor use only, and we all know that would have a big effect on, on rat control particularly. So what will happen if, if we don't see what we want to see going forward, I, I suspect that there'll be this, this pairing away of our chances to use these, these products. Um, and certainly, an indoor-only restriction was their preferred option when we, when we began this stewardship discussion with, with them. So that's what HSE wanted to happen, and we've managed to avoid that. So we've got to work hard, um, get the stewardship thing right, and let's hope we can all carry on using rodenticides responsibly. Anyone else on the panel like to come in on that? Anyone else, anything to add to that? I think Alan's okay. uh, summed it up uh, very accurately. Nothing, um, nothing to add, really, from my side. Okay, thank you, um, Steve. You, you've got uh, you've got another question. Yes, we're taking it in order on on this sheet. So, okay. Uh, what is the up to date situation with stewardship in the non pest control sectors? Is it being taken seriously? And if not, how would their their actions reflect on the results of stewardship? Okay. Did every did everybody hear, Steve? I'm finding it difficult to hear here up here. 
everyone okay with that? Okay. Uh, so, so re re really, what's the up-to-date situation with stewardship in the non-pest control sector? Is it being taken seriously? If not, how will their actions affect the, uh, reflect on the results of stewardship? Uh, could I ask Tom, could you give us your view on that, please? Okay, thank you very much for the question. So, as I say, I'm a, uh, I'm a farmer in North Hertfordshire, cereal and poultry, and I represent the NFU. And two years ago, just over two years ago, Alan, on behalf of Crew, uh, approached the NFU with the information that HSE were looking to ban the use of uh, rodenticides uh, unless, uh, 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 if it wasn't for professional reasons. And so we've been engaged quite readily uh, for the last two years. And it's been an extremely difficult campaign to publicise. The NFU represent 55,000 farmers. It's assumed that there's in excess of 120,000 farmers in the UK. And it's been jolly hard engaging with all sectors of the media to try and get out the message that uh, things are changing and we need to be engaged. So what has happened? Well, there have been media campaigns, and I have in front of me two magazines which go out to our members. Uh, this is a February edition, and the guys at the back may have a photograph to show what we've been up to. Um, one's for poultry, one's for all farmers. So we've got stuff here, and if you want, you can, I can circulate that. If anybody wants to come up and get them and just pass it around, you can have a look. Um, and so the message is being taken very seriously, and the points that we tried to put across to the NFU members, which, as I say, only 55,000, you can't obviously get everybody, is that by adopting decent practices, you're going to uh, prevent food loss and contamination, prevent disease, uh, prevent fires, and prevent structural damage to your buildings. Um, other than that, you know, the bigger crew message about permanent baiting, uh, the, the message of trying to reduce rodenticides found in the livers of, uh, and barn owls is a message which has been put across. But initially, we, we've, our industry has come from a base where there's been zero uh, training required in order to uh, administer rodenticides. Um, there have been on, there's online training which is uh, now accessible, which is getting uptake in agriculture, and I'm sure there are people in the audience that may be able to elaborate on what those numbers are like. But we're starting from an extremely low base, and it's a long, it's going to be a long slog getting people up to speed. I can appreciate that that might sound detrimental uh, when you're trying to be conscientious and, and using uh, rodenticides effectively, but at the same time, it is a pretty good opportunity for you guys as pest controllers, if you are in areas, to really push what you're doing as a, as a good service to offer. Okay, thank you. Anybody else like to add to that? Okay. Um, I, th I think um, I'd just like to make an additional comment. Tom's obviously referring to the, the agricultural community. I think it's fair to say that the gamekeeping community, or also another major user of Redensides, has pretty much got on board with uh, the concepts of stewardship from the start, although with a difficult concept to, to, to agree to. But once they got over that hurdle, they've been rolling out training courses and certification uh, across the UK. So. It is fair to say that there has been positive engagement, albeit uh, being pushed, uh, and, and I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Rupert. Okay, let's move on. Uh, I have a, have a question from Adam Jarvis. Where's Adam? How can you fully control um, <laughs> sales of rodenticide um, and what's to stop people who are qualified from buying it and selling it on for profit? Okay, uh, so how can you can fully control the sale of rodenticides? What's to stop people who are qualified buying it and then selling it on for a profit? Can I ask Steve to come in on that, please? Okay. So you can hear me? Yep. Uh, okay, thank you, Adam. Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. It's a very important one, I think, for everybody involved in crew and the stewardship campaign. Uh, stewardship scheme is a, is, a, is a voluntary scheme. Um, I think uh, there's some debate as to whether if, if, if government had made this re official regulation, it would have been 
perhaps easier to police and enforce. Um, but I think government generally now are, they're, they're actually encouraged not to introduce more red tape. So uh, very much uh, that they, they approached crew with um, uh, the, you know, the demand that the industry needed to get its house in order. So uh, one, one thing I think we do have uh, is the product label. Uh, as you'll be aware, the, the new labels will refer to stewardship condition labeling. And so I think there is some legal weight is, with regards to uh, end users using the label, uh, using the product as per the label. So I think certainly there is the ability to, for some, from some, some legal weight there. But really, uh, it's going to be down to the whole industry to, to get behind stewardship. And um, as far as policing it, I think perhaps it's not savoury to some, but you know, whistle blowing is certainly something that um, I think we're going to we're going to re rely on uh, companies to sort of report report bad practice. And if if they see almost rogue trade activity where somebody looks to sell this on to to an, an end user that's not qualified, then you know the likes of crew need to know that so we we can investigate it and um, you know, bring bring this to light. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a difficult one, but we, you know, we're at the start of a, a new stewardship scheme, and I think over time uh, we'll find ways to improve the policing of, 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 to make sure that the, the, the scheme is being adhered to. But, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a difficult one. Okay. <clears throat> so, so, so you're saying that you, we, can't, we, we can't give you a 100% guarantee that, that we can control the sale of, of, of we can't control this straight away. I think it's all, it, it sounds like it's all down to us to pull together on well, this, to, to look after the industry for ourselves. I, I think in all industries, you know, that you get rogue traders, don't you? Yeah. If, if they see an opportunity, that's very difficult for us to do much about. If, if they're of that mindset, you know, it's very difficult to control. Um, what we ask and we hope everybody embraces, uh, that, you know, what, why, why stewardship's been requested and brought in is uh, there's a real threat to the environment, to wildlife, and, uh, you know, it's, it's in our interest to maintain these products on the market and um, it's going to have to be self-policed. You know, a lot of these schemes uh, that are introduced on a voluntary basis very much have to be self-policed. Okay. Anybody else want to add? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, I think there's just one, one more thing to add. Um, the, the, the new labels um, make it a legal responsibility on the, on the seller to ensure that they sell products only to certificated um, users. So in the scenario that you painted, that someone buys it and, and, and buys a bit extra for, it, for his uns, uncertificated mate and passes it on, um, previously that would not have been illegal. It, it now is illegal and it's contrary to the label. So it, it, it's, it's um, against the label requirements not only to pass it on, but, but also to use it as well. So in the scenario that you painted, both of those characters are rep reprehensible and um, legal um, comebacks would be possible against both of them. I, I think I'd just like to add one extra point, which is um, there, there is a commitment. No scheme is foolproof. Let's all accept that. Uh, but you have to strive to make it as, as good as it possibly can to make sure it delivers. There is an absolute commitment from authorization holders all the way through to the end point of supply to end users to uh, apply stewardship. That is absolute. Um, now, there is nothing to stop uh, a company who buys seek to selling it on uh, to, um, to, to somebody who is uncertificated. But if they do so, they risk breaking the law and they also risk breaking the, um, uh, the agreement that they have with their supplier and that will result in withdrawal of supply. So there are consequences, whether it's legal or supply. So there are protections in place, even if I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's foolproof, but there are protections in place. Is that, is that okay? Is that, I think it's a cracking answer. Thank you. Uh, can we go to John Forrest, please? The, the microphone's coming your way. <clears throat> Thanks, Martin. Uh, it's probably a question for um, Alan. And I was wondering why uh, companies are able to apply and use the Wildlife Aware logo without having to undergo uh, the one-day course and the test. And the reason why I'm asking that is because I believe it's eroding uh, the value of the exam and the certificate. Th thank you. Um, the quick answer is they are absolutely not allowed to use it. Um, pe and, and the Wildlife Aware um, qualification um, is 
is awarded to individuals. And so it's the, it's the person who sits the course, takes the exam, then becomes accredited. And that individual can use the, the logo. Um, the people are off, who, who use the logo have to sign a license agreement from Crew, so we, we license that use. Um, any unlicensed use, um, we would follow up and ask that logo to be removed from whatever materials um, we see it on. Um, on the Crew website, there's a contact Crew opportunity. Um, what we would ask, obviously, is some details. We, we, we need to know who it is and, and, and where you've seen these things, and we will take it up. But the quick answer is they're not allowed to do that. Right. right thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, could we go to John McCann, please? Is John in the room? John's in the room. Again, uh, my question to the panel was, and for the delegates here, is, is seriously, how are we going to police what you're telling us? It, are you telling us that everybody in this room has got to look at what they're doing and nobody will ever come along and check what they're doing? Yeah. Is that what you're saying to us? Okay, John, thanks for the question. I think it's a great question. How is this policed? Uh, so the question is, the answer to it is that this has to be self-policing. HSE from the start and consistently throughout the whole process of development of the stewardship regime has absolutely made it clear this has to be self-policing. Industry has a chance, whether it's professional pest control sector, farming sector, gamekeeping sector, doesn't matter. Industry has a chance to make sure that it self-polices this. If we don't, there are consequences. Now, what does self-policing mean, John? I think that's a great question. Well, it means a number of things. Again, there's not one way of self-policing. I think trade associations have a role to play in this. Farm assurance schemes have a role to play in this. Suppliers have a role to play in this. Authorisation holders have a role to play in this. End users have a role to play in this. Whistleblowing has already been mentioned. Mm. That has a role to play in this. There, there is no one silver bullet to policing this. There's a number of things. Now, that risks there being gaps, absolutely. But I think if people commit to taking responsibility for the use of these products, not just in your own business, but in looking and seeing what happens to these in the, in the market, how they're used, and don't just turn a blind eye, then there's a real chance that that policing can mean something. So when it comes down to policing, it has to be self-policed. That's what HEC have set out, and that's what industry is committed to deliver. And there are multiple ways of doing it. I hope that answers your question. It's all right saying what happens if it's down to us, but there might be 30% of people in here that could not do what you're requesting, and everybody else is doing what you're requesting, but that 30% could then degenerate downwards, and we have all got to then go back to the HSA, and then they're going to implement legislation against it. That can happen. Yep. That's what you're saying. I, I think uh, the point you're making is, is, that, uh, is everybody going to commit? Um, I, I don't know the answer. I suspect probably not. But on the other hand, I can't say with any confidence. I would hope that every single person in this room goes away committed to the process and committed to uh, applying stewardship correctly. And, and you are our eyes and ears as well. If you see bad practice, don't sit on it. Flag it. Flag it to your trade association. Flag it to your supplier. Uh, flag it. Um, there are multiple ways you can do it. You can send it to crew. Um, so, so don't sit back, don't ignore, do flag it. And if you're not seeing action, and, and as long as it's evidentially based, if you're not seeing action, you need to escalate it. I think the point that Rupert makes about flagging it up to, to bodies such as trade associations and, uh, and distributors, suppliers, is, is an excellent one because we all have a vested interest to, to keep these products it's very, very, it's important for, for, for Rupert's, Rupert's business, Steve's business, and any supplier to keep these products. You know, they don't want to lose it. We as pest controllers don't want to lose them either. So we've, we've just got to all play our part in this. Uh, Tom, I think, I think you had a, a, a point to make on this one. Well, the point I was going to make is just, was purely a technical one, that we have accountability through on-farm assurance schemes. Now, make of those what you like, but as I said in my first answer, we're starting from a very low base. I personally and the NFU feel that this, is, this isn't a silver bullet, this isn't going to be an overnight success story, this is work in progress. And whatever people are audited upon 
this year, you know, at the beginning of the process, will develop and in future years be can become a lot more um, robust. So engage with the majority now. You're always going to get the people who lag behind, but really they're... Those, those are the dying businesses, aren't they? They may be problematic for you um, and, and could compromise, you know, the goodwill of, 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 of both, well, of all sectors. But, um, you know, make, you know, use, use the people who are successful as your, uh, as your shining beacons of what, what is required. And, and really, I mean, we, I have multiple sites, uh, one that um, is uh, looked after in-house, one that I use a professional pest controller in, and it's a damn sight easier on the professional pest controlling site um, to have it, uh, uh, to, to, to have my site, um, um, you know, looked after. Um, you, you just go down the route of least resistance, really, and uh, when, it, when it comes to the accountability for your auditing, I think that's something that will develop over time. Alan, just, just one final thing to say. Um, certainly all the way through the discussions we've been having with HSE, um, this word self-policing voluntary came up time and, time and again. And so that is exactly what you've heard before. But there is a hotline, and I, um, if you want to go to the Wildlife Incident Investigation Scheme hotline, which is on the Pesticide Safety Directorate website, it, it's got a number, um, and if you tell what you've seen, if you see a bait being used irresponsibly, if you see um, risks being generated by the use of rodenticides ir irresponsibly, um, dial that, that hotline and someone should investigate that circumstance, as long as you can give them the details which would allow them to, to, uh, to do that. So there are government um, mechanisms in place also to police um, some of this stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, could we go to John Sage, please? Is John here? Um, yes, good afternoon. Um, before I ask my question, may I make a comment? Um, someone asked a question about the use of the Think um, Wildlife, the Wildlife Aware logo and devaluing the examination and the course. On the CRIU Think Wildlife website, if you go on there, you can become a supporter and you're allowed to use the logo without having to take any examination or course. Um, just a comment. Um, can, um, can I just, can can I just quickly respond to that? There, there, there are two logos. Think Wildlife is associated with the crew supporter status. Anybody can use that. They do have to sign up and we do have to license it. But there's also the Wildlife Aware logo, which is separate. It, it's associated with the Wildlife Aware course. And, and that is a, a separate license agreement that we have with those who take that course. So they're two separate things that you've just sort of got mixed together, I think. Yeah, um, I know that. And I would suggest everybody in this room knows that. But customers looking on our websites or on our documentation don't necessarily know. It's a comment. I don't have a solution. I'm just pointing out something that's been pointed out to me by my customers. Oh, thank you for that. Um, my question, um, it's been partially answered already. How will internet sales of professional use rodenticides be policed and controlled? Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask the two, the two manufacturers and distributors that we have uh, sitting up here, uh, and Rupert and Steve to come in on this, please. Okay, so, John, thanks for that question. It's a great one. came up early in the consideration of how to deliver stewardship. Well, the bottom line is, is internet sellers are the same as anyone uh, and will not be treated in any way differently from a company that distributes or sells with insides in a physical form to you. So, what does that mean in practice? It means that you will not be able to go onto an internet selling website and tick a self-declaration. They have to, if, they're not, if you are not known to them as a customer, they have to seek positive ID from you, photo ID from you, before they open up an account. Secondly, uh, they must ask for proof of competence in terms of certification in the same way that if you went to Baratine or Kilge or anyone else, um, they, they, are, they have to adhere to that. Okay, so... The question then becomes, are they going to do it? Well, it's down to the people who supply them. And the people who supply them have to know where the product is going. And they have an obligation and responsibility. So, again, it goes back to the policing question that we, that, that we answered earlier. 
um, if a company is, you can split it into two ways. You've got the, you've got the eBay route, and then you've got the, 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 the more uh, established internet sellers. Established internet sellers have to go through that process. If you find something on eBay, I know Simon's done some great work with, uh, with BPCA, with eBay, in terms of reporting illegal sales of products. There are mechanisms to flag up and report them if they're being done incorrectly. So, internet selling, although it's, it's a bit of a sweeping statement, it absolutely has to be treated in exactly the same way as any other route to market. And I hope that answers your question. Steve. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to add to that, uh, as, uh, as I understand it uh, at this moment in time, all professional labelled redenticides will eventually end up with stewardship condition labels. So every UK approved redenticide for outdoor in and around buildings use. Um, so it will be the duty of, and, and all manufacturers, all approval holders have signed up to the crew stewardship scheme. So just to reinforce Rupert's point, every professional <laughs> event aside will eventually be under stewardship conditions. So it follows that if the manufacturers and the distributors working with all their sub-distribution -distrib partners, uh, if, they're, if they're working to the, the, the stewardship code properly, they will also insist that this is, is, is happening. Uh, as Rupert said, whether it's an internet seller, whether it's an ag store, whether it's online, whether it's a, you know, a, a professional pest control distributor. Um, and so, yeah, again, collectively, back to policing and uh, making the stewardship thing work, we've all got a duty to make sure that that, that circle is complete. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I go to Phil Halpin, please? <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, so my question relates to sort of tra training, really. Um, given that some pest control firms, particularly rurally based, are finding it difficult to come to terms with the end of permanent, preventative, long-term baiting, uh, particularly around problematic pest control sites, does Crew think it could improve in delivering its message to help pest controllers out there come to terms with the implications uh, of stewardship, particularly maybe through the use of video case studies uh, focusing on a practical, methodical approach of how stewardship can be applied? Well, that's a hell of a question. Um, I, I'm, and so, because it's a hell of a question, I'm going to give it to Henry to answer. Yes, thank you for that, Phil. Um, in, ter in, in terms of coming to terms with um, the long-term permanent baiting, I, I mean, that really is just not an option. It's a simple answer. We, you know, we are where we're at. And it's no, it's no longer an option to say, well, I'm going to do either or. The message itself, I think, for the pest controllers us out there is, is we have to look at this as an opportunity rather than simply seeing it as a barrier. Um, we, we as an industry have relied heavily on the bait box and the bait. And I think to a certain extent we've, we've almost lost sight of where we should be going in terms of IPM, integrated pest management, I'm sure you're all aware of. So, as far as crew goes, I think the, I don't think the message really from crew in terms of stewardship is actually anything new. I think a lot of it is actually just about refocusing what we should be doing as professional pest controllers anyway. Um, that that would be my message to, to, to those those guys out there that are saying that oh, since I've lost the, the chance to permanent bait, my, I'm, I can't control my problems. I think go back and reassess how you're actually approaching your problem, and. Uh, uh, and uh, actually look, look, look at it from an, an IPM point of view. Alan, do you have any anything to add on that, seeing as it's crew-based? Um, well, I, I, just to say something about, about the permanent baiting um, question, because that was sort of w woven into your, in, into your question. Um, HSE is, is not banning permanent baiting, and so crew is not um, banning permanent baiting. Uh, and, and that there will be a document coming out very soon from Crew, which gives a, a sort of a framework um, for what to do um, in considering um, permanent baiting. So there will be some specific advice coming out quite 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 soon about about that, and that might help professional pest controllers um, get over the message to their customers. And I'm, we're very well aware that that many customers just want the professionals to come in, fill up the bait boxes and, and keep the bait out there and your message to them is, well, that's not a good idea because, because, and we want to help you to get that message over. So there will be something coming out shortly. Okay. Um, Michael Brown. We have a question from Michael Brown. Is he here? He is. Uh, 
Uh, my question, I've heard local to myself that gamekeepers have sat a day's training that included a test at the end of it. And during this test, the answers were given out one at a time as the candidates filled in their answers. How is this going to improve responsible use in the countryside? Hot potato there one, uh, and Steve. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, well, I, I think uh, if, if that indeed is the case, then uh, that would be you know, shocking to say the least. And I think clearly the answer is uh, it won't improve uh, responsible relentless rent side use. And, and I think we, you know, we are sort of back to uh, policing. You know, this is a new thing, a new stewardship scheme that uh, is about to be launched. Um, so I think we, we must remember we've made huge strides to get to where we are now, um, even though we're only at the launch stage. So, uh, but part of this, as we sort of see it un unveiled, uh, yeah, we, we, we may come across activities like this. And uh, it's important any such activity like that uh, is reported to crew. Uh, any of the uh, manufacturers or suppliers that are supplying product, uh, we would take this further uh, within the, 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 the crew stewardship scheme and, 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 and discuss it with colleagues. But uh, I mean, absolutely, if that sort of practice is going on, we, we need, first and foremost, we need firm, hard evidence so that we can go and mm -hmm. tackle it mm -hmm. and take it to maybe the NGO, National Gamekeepers Association, or the NFU. Um, but you know, we we've got a passion to make this work for all the right reasons, for you know, environmental protection, to make sure these products stay on the market. Um, so we really do need to crack down on anything like that. So if you're hearing of situations where the answers are being given out, um, then we, we need to know who who's who's laying that course on, and then we need to go and you know sort that out very quickly. Go on. Yeah, um, I'll, uh, I shall try and find out more information. I'll get it to you. Thank you. I'd just like to take this opportunity as well to say welcome to the NFU. It's the first time NFU has been in to one of these uh, things that I've been involved with in the last three years. And uh, it's good to say that the guys are here. Yeah. Thank you. I just had one more thing to say about I, th I think you mentioned that that course that you heard about was, was, a, was for gamekeepers. Um, it's uh, purely for gamekeepers yeah. to gain a certificate so they can carry on buying rodenticide. Okay. Well, I, I, I wrote that course for gamekeepers and worked with the um, NGO, um, Basque, and all of those people to bring that course together. Um, it's run in association with BASIS, and BASIS, um, and, and there are two ways to take the exam for that course. One is online afterwards, and the other is in the room. And if, if the course opts for the in-the-room question and answer option, there should be a BASIS invigilator in the room to stop exactly what you've just described happening. So if that didn't happen in that particular case, um, maybe there's someone from BASIS that we need to speak to, but we, we arranged it so that that couldn't happen and, and there should be a BASIS body in the room to stop it. Right, sir, I'll find out more and I'll get the information to you. I, th I think the last thing to say is just to emphasise what both Steve and Alan have said, evidence-based. Anecdotal is no good to us. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, if it's an anecdote, that doesn't help. Get us the evidence, and it will be acted on by the awarding body and by the crew to, uh, training and certification work, uh, work group. Thank you. Uh, Tim Cox. Is Tim here? OK, well, I'm going to read out Tim's question, because he isn't here. <coughs> uh, how would the panel best sell the stewardship scheme to a sceptical skeptical, skeptical, customer, be they an existing or a new customer? Henry. This is where I give away all my sales patter, is it? Um, <laughs> listen, I, I think um, probably the best way I can answer this is perhaps to give an analogy. Um, 20 years ago, if you walked into a doctor, overweight, heavy smoker, um, drank too much, Martin, um, he, might, he, might, he might turn around and say, oh, yeah, here you go. Here, here's, here's, here's a, and you're not feeling very well. Here's a pill for this. Here, here's, a, here's a pill for that and have this spray. Um, those days have moved on. If you walk into a doctor with all those now, the first thing he'll say to you is more than likely lose some weight, stop smoking, stop drinking, take some regular exercise. And I kind of think, I'm sort of almost going back to what I was saying earlier, that our industry really um, it needs to think in those terms. When the customer rings up and says, I've got a mouse problem, be it an existing one or a new one, to simply walk in there and, and tell him, 
in so many words as, oh, I'm going to, you know, I've heard it a million times, I'm going to lace your, your site with pesticides, I'm going I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bait here, I'm going to sticky board here, rather than, actually, rather than actually looking at the problem and saying, well, let's talk about your hygiene on your site, let's talk about the proofing on your building, let's talk about cutting back the bushes, all the stuff we all know. I think really that's really what, for me, the stewardship program is all about. It, it's, it's saying, look, the pesticides are there if we need them, but we don't need, to, we don't, but, but we're not able just to use them now in the way we did before. And actually, that's a good thing. Um, I don't know. Does, does that answer the question? Uh, uh, well, it's an answer. It's Which, an answer. It is an answer. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, I, I suppose. I suppose. Yeah. Please. Please. Yeah. The use of pesticides is the last resort. Yep. Right? Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Exactly, yeah. yep. Yeah, yeah. and that, that's really what I'm saying. And I, and I think you know, to, to a sceptical customer, that, that's the message you've got to say. You know, for our, our, our industry has been devalued for so long on the basis that we judge by the chemicals we use and not the advice we give, and it should be the other way around. Yeah, I, I mean, j just on a on a on a uh, on a personal uh, basis here, when when I went through my training, which is f f t too long ago for me to remember now, but but the but the original thing, and there'll be people in this room that will remember this three-letter mnemonic of ERD: exclusion, restriction, destruction. Destruction happens to be at the end of it, not at the start. So that's when we should be using the pesticides if we can't solve it with, with the other methods. So there's, there's nothing new here at all. That's my take on it. I know I'm meant to be chairing it, but that's my opinion. There's nothing new here. Uh, which, there's just a, a, a very serious movement to making it happen properly across the board. Tom, do you have a, a comment yeah, on this? Yeah, could I just come Please in at the you. end yeah. to say... Um, Farming is always getting a new generation of uh, employees in. And I think I'm right in saying, Alan, that right at the beginning, we were discussing about how, how a little bit of education at a college course can do an awful lot of good. You know, you're not, you're not going to your 45, 50-year-old farmer who's going to be stuck in their way. You're going to your 19, 20-year-old individual at university who knows about, well, who, who's, who's informed about your, you know, the, the ER... M. ERD. ERD, you yeah. just mentioned about tidy up your farm. You know, a tidy farmer is a proud farmer. I mean, that's going to that's gonna help out massive amounts, isn't it? And then you're going to reduce your re use of redenticides, and that's going to be beneficial for everybody. Mm. So okay. we want to get something on the education level, I think. Uh, we, we are running close to, uh, to time up, so I'm just going to jump to uh, a question here from Adam Jarvis. Is Adam, is Adam here? Oh, good, here he is. Yes, because he had a question before, so he's still here, yes. Uh, poisoning rodents, um, if once was the most effective way to kill and reduce um, rodent numbers, if we take rodenticides away and move to more or less effective methods, um, is it not going to make the problems bigger? Can I ask Alan to come in on that, please? Uh, did everyone... I'll just, I'll just uh, read that one out. Poisoning rodents is one of the most effective ways to kill and reduce rodent numbers. If you take away rodenticides and move to, doing other, move to other less effective methods, is it not going to make rodent problems bigger? Um, I'm going to find it quite hard to answer that, really. Um, I, I, it is one of the most effective. It's one of the most effective, but there are other methods, and we've heard from other members of the panel, um, IPM and... ERD and all, all of those other things. So, so it, it, it's part of the um, part of the story. Uh, I don't think anyone is talking about us actually losing it, uh, and so I, I don't think there's an immediate risk that all of you folks are going to find yourselves absolutely without anticoagulant rodenticides. At least I very much hope that's not going to be the case. I, I think that no one would argue with the, your last point, which says if we do lose them, then um, doing good rodent control will certainly become much more difficult. And, and I, I think the regulators across Europe understand that. And I come back to something that I started with when we begin to talk about stewardship. Um, the regulators in Europe have stacked up three reasons why rodenticides, anticoagulants, should be banned. And any one of them would normally ban these substances across the whole of Europe. And they've managed to stack three different reasons. You might have heard Philip Bernays talk about the reprotox. That's, that's one of the reasons. But 
they still allow them to be sold and used, and that's because they recognise just what you've said, they are one of the most effective and necessary um, interventions that we have for rodent control. So we just have to get better at using them and show that we're getting better. OK. Ah, oh, we've got... Sorry, yeah. Just one other thing there. I Please personally, do. in my opinion, find the best way of dealing with rodents, very effectively, is actually to take away the food, um, take away the harbourage, yep. bolster the buildings up, and then the poor blighters starve to death. <laughs> so that's a far better way of dealing with them. Well, there we Good go. Good to yes. you. Do we have time for one more question? We have time for one more question. Um, my old friend Howard Tafts. Where's Howard? There he is. Hello there. My question is, what work has been done on the attitude of the agricultural industry to the likely increased costs of pest control, and what were the results of this work? OK. Uh, I'm going to ask for two inputs here. One who does a lot of pest control for the agricultural industry, and that's Henry. And then somebody who is involved in farming himself, and that's Tom. So, Henry first. Um, I, I, as far as I'm aware, I don't think any work's been done in terms of um, uh, the attitude of the agriculture industry in spending more money, other than, um, as Tom and there alluded to in their various magazines, Mm -hmm. advising them of the, the changes that have come around. Um, so what, what's the reaction of your farming community, your customers, when, you, when you've been to talk to them about this? I would guess it's probably mixed. Certainly that's been my impression. But okay. it's dead silence over there. <laughs> okay, Tom, could, could, can, you, can I ask you to come in? Yeah, okay, so uh, one of my first answers uh, made out that I've got couple of sites, one with, uh, one with professional users in, one without, and it probably comes as no surprise that the one where we don't use professional controllers is because there's a family member who thinks it's better that they do it. And uh, when I told them the cost, then uh, that, that, that caused a little bit of a problem. So it obviously comes as no surprise when you approach a farmer and tell them there's going to be a cost implication that uh, you know, you're up against you're up against a problem immediately. But having said that that, that, that message has not been put across through the media because right now you're tr we're trying to engage with your farmers from, from a, this base of zero uptake to you know, a, a, an understanding of what is required for the use of rodenticide. Um, I think you're going to have... It's going to be an uphill struggle, isn't it, to try and tell your farmers it's going to be £36 a visit or whatever, your, whatever the cost of your visit is per farm and you need to do one a month or maybe you're going to have to do one a day for the first 14 days to establish what your problem is. But, think, but you've got to try and engage the person when you're selling yourself and your product the long-term benefits. If you're not getting the fires, if you are improving the facility of your buildings, if you're improving the product that you're trying to sell. And most importantly for me, when I'm sitting in that audit and I can just, I can give a file with my, for, that my professional pest controller has, has produced using the equipment that he's, um, you know, stating what equipment he's got, what problems have occurred, and the person who's auditing me can just tick that box and say, yes, that's compliant. I know he's done a good job and the, uh, the, the auditor knows that I comply. It's, it's, a, it's a damn sight easier win to know that that I can conform f f on, on, the, on that farm. You've, got to, you've really got to sell yourself and your merits and pick up a one you said earlier that you've, you've let yourself down or you're an undervalued product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would agree with that. You probably are. You want to get out to some trade fairs and sell yourself. You've got loads of county shows coming up. You've got loads of farming events coming up. Pick and poultry in May get there and sell yourselves. Ripon. Just, uh, just want to add one thing. It doesn't uh, answer your question about costs, but I did want to make the point about the fact that uh, as part of its exercise of monitoring, one of, one of the bits of work that CREW has undertaken is a knowledge, attitudes and practice benchmark, both on the professional pest control sector and also on the agricultural sector. And that's forming a benchmark in terms of how people are con conducting rodent control today, and that will be used as a reference point for the future. So, it d although it doesn't talk about costs, 
it certainly creates a benchmark across different parts of the uh, user sp spectrum. I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Okay, right, thank you. All right, we, uh, we've run out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of the people that put uh, questions uh, forward. We weren't able to get to all of the questions because we have a limited time slot. But thank you very much, and I hope you'll, I hope you'll agree that we've selected some... Uh, we've not dodged the issues here at all. Uh, we've we've um, uh, put questions up here that, that are important uh, to everyone and um, important to this, this, this very crucial subject. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, on, on your behalf, uh, the panel for, uh, for taking part in this and giving their, their opinions and answers because uh, I, think it's been, I think it's been most beneficial. But thanks, to, thanks uh, mostly to all of you uh, for attending and hopefully you've, uh, you've, you've got some benefit out of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.